Welcome, everyone. What a fantastic showing for just one of the sessions that were, are beginning this remarkable and very important weekend on media democracy in this country. I'm Amy Goodman, host of Democracy Now! I hope you all watch it, listen to it, read it, and send it around. And today we have an illustrious panel to talk about WikiLeaks journalism and modern day muckraking. Um, the panelists, Emily Bell, Glenn Greenwald, Greg Mitchell, Christopher Warren, Mika Sifri. We're gonna hear from each of them for around seven minutes, and then we're going to have a conversation and we want you to join in that. So as you think of questions, just pass them forward on your index cards. We have about, oh, an hour and 20 minutes for this discussion. I really do think of information as power, information that we get to make decisions about how our country should act can determine whether people live or die. Um, WikiLeaks, in one of its releases of the Iraq war logs, showed us that in February of 2007, there was an Apache unit hovering overhead Two men below raise their hands and surrender. The soldiers in the Apache helicopter call back to base. The lawyer on the base says, you cannot surrender to a helicopter, and the men below are blown away. This was in February of 2007. If we knew that at the time, I think there would have been an outcry there would have been call for an investigation. And if that investigation were done, perhaps there would have been charges brought, but at least we would have learned about it at the time. And why does it matter? Well, we'll move back, we'll move forward just five months to July of 2007. July 2007, that took place in February of 2007. The videotape that was released by WikiLeaks of the same Apache helicopter unit in New Baghdad, hovering over this area of Baghdad. To say the least, chilling, as you hear the soldiers laughing, cursing, not though acting as rogue soldiers, constantly calling up the chain of command to decide whether they should blow away the men below, the men they saw gathered. Among them, it turns out, was Namir Noureldin, a young up-and-coming videographer for Reuters, uh, Saeed Shema, the fixer, the driver for Reuters, who was beloved by many Reuters reporters. You know, fixers, drivers are the protectors of the reporters and the photographers, often the ones that bring them to the story. Forty years old, father of four and a group of men are showing them what is happening in this war-ravaged area. The Apache helicopter above blows them all away. I think it was Saeed Shema that was trying to crawl away, didn't quite die in the first blast. And so a van pulls up to help him, and there are the helicopter and all this is on the videotape. It's not a peace activist videotape from the ground, but the videotape taken by the Apache helicopter itself and the van pulls up. There are children in the van, people who are coming out to help the wounded. And that's when the Apache helicopter opens fire again and they kill those in the van. They critically wound the children. And on Democracy Now! just by chance, last year, after this all came out, we were interviewing a soldier, a young soldier named Ethan McCord, who was one of those involved with a protest calling for President Obama not to send PTSD soldiers back to Afghanistan and Iraq. They were marching from, I think it was, oh, 
Walter Reed Hospital to Arlington Cemetery, saying, please don't send us back. And I asked Ethan McCord, who was on that march, why, why are you on this march? Why do you feel so strongly? He said he had a horrible experience July 12, 2007. He was one of a few soldiers on the ground when this Apache helicopter had opened fire on these civilians below, and he was the one who held the children. And um, he handed them over and went back to base. He was washing the blood from the children on his shirt, and he asked uh, his staff sergeant if he could see mental health. He said he was just torn apart. He could not get the images out of his head, and they told him to suck it up. Um, and he's been falling apart ever since. Just learning that story by chance, that's the story that's on that videotape as well, and interviewing another soldier who was sick that day. And he didn't go out on the Apache helicopter. And when his brothers came back, when the, fel when the other soldiers came back and described what happened, when he saw the videotape, he knew that that was what they were describing. And we had him on, he said, I don't understand why you're making such a big deal of this. And I said, well, why don't you think it's significant when this, um, these reporters, these young children, injured, killed, and he said, no, I do think it's a big deal, but this happens every day. Why just focus on this? I think WikiLeaks matters. I think it is a matter of life and death. If we had known at the time what happened in February of 2007, I dare say that July 2007 would not have happened. So what does it mean to get this information? That's what we're going to talk about on the panel today. To people who are dedicated to transparency and what it means um, to have WikiLeaks and to go beyond what it means for journalism today. We're going to begin with Greg Mitchell, um, who has been remarkable in writing a daily blog that has gained a wide global audience every day releasing more information about WikiLeaks. Two of his latest books that have just come out are The Age of WikiLeaks from Collateral Murder to Cablegate and Beyond. Uh, Greg uh, blogs for The Nation, um, has written So Wrong for So Long, How the Press, the Pundits, and the President Failed on Iraq. His, one of his latest books is also Bradley Manning, Truth and Consequences. Remarkable. I think these came out in the last uh, few weeks or months. I think he's giving birth to one as he speaks today, yet another book. We'll let you know by the end of the panel. Um, Greg Mitchell. Okay, are we okay? All right. um, well, good morning, and uh, and welcome to this panel. Um, I, I should point out, since uh, Amy was just talking about Ethan McCord, that there's a new film about Ethan McCord that's debuting at the Tribeca Film Festival in New York. Uh, you can catch the tribe written about it. Um, and it's uh, you can find it online, uh, and it presumably will have wide wide release. Uh, and he's also said he's going to release for the first time photos from that day that have never been released before. So he's continuing his activism on this. Um, I thought since I'm first here, we, uh, we're sort of splitting up the, what we're going to be talking about. I'll just give a quick chronology for people who are a little shaky on um, WikiLeaks history in the past year, um, as many people are. So some people really have only come to WikiLeaks since uh, the Cablegate revelations. But there was so much that came out before then. Going back to the, uh, the collateral murder video, uh, which was exactly a year ago this week, um, and then followed by the Afghan war logs that came out last summer, the Iraq war logs uh, a little later in the year, I think October, and then the uh, cable gate, which broke just after Thanksgiving. Um, so that's, that's sort of the history. Now what's interesting is that perhaps one reason so many people really only got into WikiLeaks after Cablegate uh, was because those first three major releases were widely covered for a few days or a week in the media and then uh, forgotten. Uh, the collateral murder video 
uh, was shown very few, very, only snippets of it were shown on TV. It was a controversy mainly about WikiLeaks itself and, and releasing such things. And then it faded. Um, even Stephen Colbert was very critical of Assange in an interview. Um, the Afghanistan war logs came out. People were shocked by some of the revelations, civilian casualties, corruption in Afghanistan, um, Pakistan's uh, you know, bad faith and so forth. A lot of coverage for a week and then sort of forgotten. So Iraq war logs, shocking numbers about civilian casualties, uh, other issues, uh, same thing. Now, Cablegate is a little different because I, the cables have been released slowly. The others were really one-day dumps. Um, the cables were really, have been released, uh, you know, I think we're up to about 10 or 15, 20,000 that have been published now out of a quarter of a million. And uh, despite uh, places like the Washington Post and so many others saying on practically day two of the releases that, you know, nothing to see here, move along, <laughs> uh, there have been dozens, some would say hundreds of important revelations since then right down to, to this week. Uh, they're finally, I don't know if you've caught up with this, but they're finally releasing the 6,000 cables related to Israel. And there's already controversy there uh, about what, revealing about uh, some of the settlers offering the, to give up their settlements in return for money, uh, which is, is interesting. And then just today or last night, for the first time, WikiLeaks is now dealing with uh, the dreaded Washington Post. And they have a big, big, big story last night related to, to Yemen and the U.S. being told a couple years ago that there was a chance that the leader there could be deposed. And um, so the Washington Post is now involved. So really quite surprising things. Um, but it, it continues to, to, to uh, produce shockwaves. Um, the other thing I wanted to just talk about is uh, the notion, which I think is at the key to so much with this, is the role of, of gatekeepers. Uh, it's an expression I use and you know, some others use too about what the traditional role of the press in America and I guess elsewhere in the world has been to want to be the gatekeepers. In other words, they release the information, they decide what to cover, they decide how to cover it. And in relation to leaks, uh, very importantly, they, you know, for every leak you've heard of that made big news, uh, you know, there are dozens or hundreds or however many that went nowhere that were either, uh, maybe they weren't such good leaks anyway, but many of them probably are too complicated, they're too controversial, difficult, uh, didn't come to the right person or whatever. Uh, so the media wants to decide that. They want to say, we get this great information, we get these, uh, these leaks or shocking material or documents, and they want to decide, the mainstream media, what to cover and what to, what to ignore. And WikiLeaks has threatened that from the beginning by um, releasing documents raw, sometimes that causes difficulties, but uh, posting material for all to see, circumventing the, the gatekeepers of the media. Now we've seen, uh, you know, sort of interestingly in the last couple months, some of those uh, media outlets such as the New York Times and the Guardian, Al Jazeera, uh, studying setting up their own leak portals. And uh, this, is, of course, is partly a way to, to take back the gatekeeper function. So they, you know, it's going to be like, leak to us, you know. Don't leak, leak to the WikiLeaks or anybody else like that. So in some ways, it's an attempt to, again, take over that gatekeeper function. Um, and WikiLeaks itself, uh, interestingly, the collateral murder video was sort of their, in a classic release of theirs. Went, went out, everyone could see, they didn't deal with any other media. Since then, they've formed partnerships with uh, generally The Guardian, The New York Times, and uh, Al Jazeera and other places for different releases. So WikiLeaks itself found that because of the gigantic number of documents um, they uh, and limited resources, that they have started working with media. And um, which has led to a lot of coverage, a lot of very good things. Uh, they've gone to 50 outlets around the world now, which you, you don't hear much about here, perhaps, if you're not a fanatic like I am. Uh, but, you know, s news outlets around the world are now publishing the cables. So they've formed these partnerships sort of frankly saying they don't, they don't have the resources to do it themselves or maybe trust people to, to cover this stuff. But, you know, this causes problems, um, as we've seen, and Glenn Greenwald and others have written a great deal about this, um, where you have 
the New York Times, which got a lot of praise for uh, their releasing materials with, through WikiLeaks, giving them a lot of coverage for a brief while, um, finally had to admit that they had shown in, in the, the cable releases from late November and start, showed every single cable to the State Department or the CIA, whatever the group of people they were dealing with, showed them every single cable and held back some of them. We don't know how many. Uh, we don't know exactly why. So here was, uh, uh, you know, the New York Times, even in that case, uh, getting these raw documents and uh, still allowing whatever you want to call it, suppression or censorship or, or whatever. So exerting its gatekeeper function. And basically what happened after a month of coverage in the Times and the Guardian uh, coming up to the end of December, they have stopped, pretty much stopped covering the cables and now it's gone on to other publications who, you know, who are doing it. So um, it's gonna be interesting to see what, what goes on from here. And, I, and of course, as we know, the Times and the Guardian both have had problems with Assange now. A lot of bitter remarks uh, at both places. Um, and so we really don't know what they're ever going to do in the future. So perhaps that's why he's moving on to the Washington Post and so forth. Um, and just the last thing I'll mention is that there are a lot of other organizations now that have announced their own leak. Uh, they're you know from open leaks to enviro leaks and every uh, you know various causes and groups that have promised to uh, release their own leaks and get leaks. But so far nothing. We haven't had since Cablegate broke. There hasn't been anything that's come from WikiLeaks, it's new, uh, and none of these much heralded other leak projects have not produced anything yet. So I think it's open to, open to question of how much uh, trust uh, people are gonna have, and uh, you know, maybe someone will talk a little bit about the Bradley Manning case, which I, the, the, my, my latest book is about, about that, and so many different in issues raised about that, and how that, perhaps the, his treatment of him is, uh, maybe the main reason is to discourage leakers and discourage whistleblowers, even though WikiLeaks was not the blame for, uh, for his arrest in one, at all, in one bit. But yet the message that's going out seems to be, see what happens if you're, if you're a whistleblower. So, um, so there's a lot more to be said about, about the Bradley Manning case, but I will, uh, uh, I'll finish now and turn it over to other people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. <clears throat> Mika Sifri is co-founder and editor of the Personal Democracy Forum, which is a website, an annual conference that covers the ways technology is changing politics. Also, techpresident.com, the award-winning uh, group blog on how the American presidential candidates are using the web and how the web is using them. Um, Mika also consults on how political organizations, campaigns, nonprofits, and media entities can adapt to and thrive in a networked world. His latest book is called WikiLeaks uh, and the Age of Transparency. Uh, before that, uh, he wrote, is that a politician in your pocket, Washington, on $2 million a day? Spoiling for a Fight, Third Party Politics in America, and he was co-editor of the Iraq War Reader and the Gulf War Reader, Micha Sifri. Thank you, Amy. Good morning. Oh, all right, good. People are awake. I can't pull that trick. Um, it's great to be here, and it's great to see so many people here uh, who are obviously uh, concerned and uh, I hope motivated by the issues that WikiLeaks has uh, brought to the fore. Um, I'm going to make some general comments and then, and, and then get into a few specifics and hopefully leave time so that we can get the audience involved soon. Um, first, generally, uh, I think it's important to recognize that uh, the story here is not so much WikiLeaks as the larger phenomenon that it represents. It's quite possible that a year from now, we won't be talking about WikiLeaks anymore, but we will still be talking about and using our ability to do transparency to the powerful in, in very important new ways. So it's critical, I think, that we position this as part of a larger trend and a larger movement, um, which I call technology-enabled civic engagement or civic hacktivism, and it's exploding all around us. 
The reason why it is, and this is really something I get into more detail in my book, is just in the last few years, thanks to the dispersion of technology, the, the, all, the, all this computers you have in your pocket and so on, uh, and, it, and its connectedness, that activism has become more social. It's easy to start things. You don't have to wait for permission. You don't need to necessarily have a big organization to have a big impact. You don't necessarily have to have big money to reach millions of people. And lots of us are just diving in and doing it. The second, re the second big change is that information and data itself have become more fluid and connectable. Um, and that the, the internet as an open platform, as the open platform, makes that possible. WikiLeaks is just one extension of those trends. Uh, and it happens to be a really interesting one because it's transnational. It's not living in only one country. So it is harder to suppress a site like WikiLeaks thanks to the resilience of the internet and, and thousands and thousands of people willing to, uh, you know, when, when uh, uh, Amazon took its off, it, off its servers, people were set up mirror sites in other places. So that, that resilience is at the core of a new kind of transnational journalism, or at least the possibility of doing it. That's what we have to protect. But the larger trend is that the, the two big things that are changing, first of all, the people who were formerly known as the audience, as Jay Rosen likes to say, actually now want to say in making the show. And we actually want to know what's going on. And if necessary, we will pull the information together ourselves to find out. And the people who were formerly known as the authorities, and that's in both senses of the word, right? Authority as an expert and authority as in the people with the power, they're losing their, their grip on what is authoritative. And when they actually know that we can watch them and we may be able to expose them, I actually think in some cases this will result in better behavior in the long run. That is the promise of, of this bottom-up transparency movement. But it's a different environment, and in this environment, we all have to earn and re-earn our uh, trust every day. You don't get trust anymore as an authoritative source because you have a badge or because you went to the right college or because your byline appears, say, in the New York Times. Um, you earn it by being transparent and truthful. And when you're not, we're going to distrust you. The WikiLeaks is not this change. It's just a symptom of this larger change. Now, some particular comments about uh, uh, the, the WikiLeaks situation itself. First of all, I think we need to recognize that WikiLeaks itself is broken. Um, Julian Assange is a flawed figure. I, I salute his courage and his audacity and, and, and his resoluteness, but I don't like the way he runs this organization, and I'm not the only one. There are lots of people who have left uh, being volunteers for WikiLeaks because of Julian's autocratic way of running it. I don't think it is the way to run, uh, uh, it's hardly an example of transparency in action. We don't know uh, what it, it's releasing, what it's holding back, why, how you get information from WikiLeaks now, no idea. Uh, the portal for submitting leaks to WikiLeaks uh, it's been asserted by the former, one of the former programmers and spokesmen, Daniel Damscheidberg, that the portal is broken. It's not secure. So, you know, we have, to, th these are serious questions and it's important that we not, you know, push them under the rug just because, you know, it's doing otherwise noble work. Second point, the New York Times is clearly broken. Um, one thing that people may not realize is that the New York Times has an entire set of the cables, all 250,000, whatever the exact number is. Bill Keller has said this on the record. Uh, David Sanger, uh, their lead national correspondent in Washington, has said this to me directly. And there's no explanation from the Times. I'm actually right now trying to get, maybe I'll get an answer. If I do, I'll let you know, about how they handle this database inside the building. Um, as as uh, Greg mentioned, it's starting, you know, we're seeing stories appear in other places. Uh, like Reuters did a story on corruption in, in Saudi Arabia based on cables going back to 1996 about how the patronage system there works. Uh, now the Washington Post is reporting from Yemen. What the Times told us about their method for uh, digging into this gigantic uh, raw archive is that they did keyword searches. 
They basically put a team of reporters together. I guess the Guardian actually built the search interface, and people went and you know thought in enterprising ways about what words they should search on. Now, there's a very interesting clue in that statement because if if that's the method that the Times has used to spot news in the cables, then how is it that nobody at the Times searched for the word kleptocracy? Um, it turns out. Indeed, there are about six cables that have been released so far that have the word kleptocracy in them, including the one about Libya, which the Times just recently reported on. And you really have to ask, why didn't the Times consider this news back in November, December, when they were doing their big splash of news? There are cables which they've now reported on, which they had all along, that show that US diplomats thought that Libya was a complete kleptocracy, and our intelligence uh, relations with their spy service were, quote, excellent, and that they were a loyal ally in the war on terror. You'd think that that contradiction might have been news. So I think we need to pay attention to the fact that there is this incredibly valuable uh, archive of information sitting over on West 43rd Street in Manhattan. And maybe the Times is overwhelmed and they're really busy. After all, there is a lot of news going on in the world today uh, and their reporters are, you know, trying to cover it valiantly, they, maybe they could use some help. You know, maybe they should open that archive up in some fashion. But it seems to me that we should not ignore the fact that it is here in our country, that the information is here. Um, two last points. Just checking how I'm doing on time. I'll, I'll be very quick. Um, in terms of other things that are broken, it's also clear that President Obama's commitment to transparency is broken. Um, I assume Glenn will talk about this, so I'm not going to say a lot about it, but it is, WikiLeaks has yet again made very stark the, the fact that we have like two governments in the United States, the one that we elect and the one that actually decides things. Um, and on military, national security, we, it's like we have a permanent government that's impervious to democratic uh, control. Um, and this is extremely troubling. If We have to dismantle that if we're ever going to live in a truly open society. Um, my last point. The one last critical point, and, and for this conference especially important, um, WikiLeaks has shown us how valuable the internet is, uh, this distributed resource that many of us can connect to and, and, it, and upload into and not just take information out of, um, that it, it is resilient, it can be a force for democracy, and it is incredibly fragile. Um, when Amazon, uh, uh, on just the whiff of a threat from uh, Senator Lieberman, uh, decided to kick WikiLeaks off its servers uh, back in, in the fall, uh, there was no criminal case, there was no violation of copyright. These are the reasons Amazon gave for kicking WikiLeaks off, which were completely bogus. Um, you know, I thought to myself, wow, I'm beginning to understand what McCarthyism was like, when people would, you know, lose their rights without a, any sort of real, you know, uh, case being brought, just by intimidation, political intimidation. And so we have to remember and fight uh, for the unpopular speech that the internet makes possible to protect it and make sure that, that people can speak on it freely and when private companies like Amazon or PayPal or, or uh, uh, MasterCard, Visa and so on, uh, you know, violate, you know, just pick out of the thin air, you know, some violation of their terms of service. This goes way beyond net neutrality, folks. Net neutrality, if we want it, would not fix this problem. We have to think broader than that. Um, but that's what's at stake, this kind of ability to access the information that we really need. Uh, the internet is making it possible. We have to fight and make sure that we can continue to do that. Thank you. Thanks, Mika. Christopher Warren is our next speaker. Uh, he is the Federal Secretary of the Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance, the union of people who inform and entertain Australia and New Zealand. Uh, he's responsible for coordinating the industrial and professional campaigns of the union on issues to build a strong and independent media and entertainment sector that provides fair wages and conditions for creative workers. Christopher Warren. Uh, thank you very much and g'day. Uh, now, uh, I think Australian journalism can claim to have given two great gifts now 
that have each transformed American journalism. The first of those, of course, is uh, Keith Rupert Murdoch. He's now, of course, he's now, of course, an American citizen, and you can keep him. <laughs> the second is Julian Assange, because what's happening with WikiLeaks is transforming journalism. And what I want to talk about it is perhaps from inside uh, the beast of journalism, what those changes are, and and what the, how some of those changes are in fact profoundly disturbing for those of us who believe in a free and independent media. The first is that the vehicle of WikiLeaks, which is not, doesn't operate on its own, but in many ways is, is an example of how the sheer volume of the internet uh, enables us to produce more information in more forms to more people than ever before. Journalists talk about a lot of that as, as rhetoric but WikiLeaks is a classic example of how that operates. What I think is less clearly understood is how WikiLeaks it itself is being transformed by journalism. Now, I'm not one of those people who argue that WikiLeaks is somehow something that is not journalism. WikiLeaks is something that practices journalism and is itself being transformed by the craft of journalism. And actually, I'm proud of the fact that I hear a lot of criticism as you go around about Julian Assange, and if every if every journalist had to pass the sort of sort of personality test that Julian Assange is required to pass in the in the day to day cracks that are made even by supporters of his, then I think very few journalists would uh, would meet that test. And I'm proud of the fact that Julian Assange is a is a proud member of our union and has been for ten years. Now, people to say people look at WikiLeaks as though it's been, a constant, it's, been, it's been a constant entity. And in fact, WikiLeaks is something that has transformed itself and has morphed far more recognisably into something that is a media organisation. And in fact, the way it's handled so-called Cablegate is a very good example of how it has become a much more of a media organisation than it may have initially been. It started off with the intent of being a kind of a macro organisation, a macro media organisation that would produce all the information and in fact bypass journalism, bypass mainstream, uh, particularly mainstream journalism and mainstream media. And it, it is in, instead become now and has, has been forced to become by the way we consume information much more of a traditionally understood media organisation. So the reason I, I don't agree with the previous speaker who said, or WikiLeaks, or one of the previous speakers who said, one of the reasons WikiLeaks is now leaking this, this stuff out bit by bit is because they can't, and, and are working with mainstream media organisations, is not because they can't handle the volume. They're doing it because that's what media organisations do. If you've got a good story, you don't just put it all out in one, one, one day, you leak it out bit by bit. And they've, and they've handled that extremely intelligently on a global scale. Now, you'd all be familiar with the impact the stories have had on American politics. You probably wouldn't be as familiar with the impact that it's had in almost every country around the world. In Australia, for example, the main story was about how the cables revealed that senior government ministers were in regular contact with the US Embassy and advising the US uh, Ministry, the US Embassy, of political developments in Australia that they were not advising uh, the Australian people, and in one notorious example, hadn't even advised the Australian Prime Minister of. That is, that they were about to roll him in the caucus and replace him with a new Prime Minister. Uh, in New Zealand, I must say, there were actually no stories of any interest uh, in the WikiLeaks cables, but I think that says, uh, uh, says one of the great things about New Zealand. <clears throat> the, so we can see how WikiLeaks has fundamentally transformed itself into, into, a, into, a, media, into a much more of a practical media organisation. The, the second thing I think that's interesting about the impact of, of, of WikiLeaks is about what it says about us as journalists and our sense of the craft of journalism. Because I think, to be frank, one of the great weaknesses of American journalism has been shown by its response to WikiLeaks and the failure to give WikiLeaks the, and the sort of support and the sort of collective community support uh, that it needs. 
uh, there's been talk about the, the, the New York Times, and I think the, the description of the New York or the characterisation of the New York Times, or the way in which the New York Times characterised WikiLeaks as being more of a source rather than a media organisation, is I think itself a very dangerous position to take. Because if WikiLeaks is a source and Julian Assange is a source, then he's subject to the same penalties of, uh, for criminal action as anybody else who leaks, uh, who leaks information without the protection that journalists claim for themselves. And to uh, seek to exclude WikiLeaks and the operators of WikiLeaks from the journalist community or from the media community is not just a bit of self-importance, it's actually quite a dangerous step for, the media, for media organisations to take. I want to contrast that, if I may, with some pride with the difference between the way the media community in Australia has responded uh, to this. And we were under the same sort of pressure. The Australian Prime Minister came out very early on and characterised the actions of WikiLeaks as illegal and directed the uh, Federal Police and the Attorney General to investigate uh, laying charges. The response was not to run cold, as it was for too, for too much of the journalist community and media community in the United States. It was actually to fight back. Now, of course, we're the union. We put out a statement condemning that. Well, everyone expects us to do that. That's, what, that's kind of what we do. What was more important, for the first time in the history of the country, almost every editor of a, of a major uh, newspaper, and some not so major newspapers, or an exec or executive producer or news director of the television and radio stations, signed a joint letter to the Prime Minister declaring their belief that WikiLeaks was a, was a bona fide media organisation, that they had con they'd committed no crimes under Australian law, and that as an Australian citizen, Julian Assange was entitled to all the protections that an Australian citizen uh, should get. And what was interesting about that is that not only did every, uh, almost virtually every editor did, but almost every one of Rupert Murdoch's editors signed it uh, as well. And I think that's a very strong indication of the strong response from the Australian media community, which has acted to prevent the kind of hysteria about WikiLeaks that has, that has unfortunately continued to plague the, uh, the US media. And I, most of those people did it, obviously partly out of a sense of, a sense of justice and fair play, but because they understood what I think too few American journalists understand, which is that if we allow WikiLeaks to be singled out and if we allow Julian Assange to be charged with espionage, which is one of the threats that's, that's been made, then that's not a threat just for WikiLeaks or for Julian Assange. It's a, it's a, it's a threat to every person who seeks to practice independent journalism or even not independent journalism in the developed world today. And I think, there are, I think there are two reasons, if I may be so bold, uh, to criticise my American counterparts about why that's happened. One is pretension. The sense of, I'm a real journalist, these people aren't. And that's a failure to understand how journalism is changing fundamentally in, in the world and a failure to understand the way WikiLeaks itself has changed as a media organisation. Uh, secondly, there remains in the United States this continued fear that affects the, the way journalists and media organisations report the news that flows from the, the security response to 9-11. And until the, until the American media are able to get over that and to recognise that their responsibility is to inform, to educate, to entertain with, with, with respect for the truth and for the public's right to know the truth, then we will continue to cause uh, rods for, our, for the back, not just of journalists in the United States, but for journalists all around the world. The, the third point I just quickly want to mention is the impact on whistleblowers, which has, which has already been mentioned. The, we, the, what we are seeing as a result of technology is an increasing attack on whistleblowers, again, not just in the United States, but around the world. Bradley Manning uh, is, a, is just the most severe example uh, of that even though I think we should all recognise the case against Bradley Manning is remarkably thin and if it was not occurring in the military context, it would simply not be occurring uh, at all. And the final thing, and I, I, but one thing I do really want to strongly agree with the point that uh, the previous speaker, uh, Mika, made about the impact on the infrastructure that surrounded, that surrounded WikiLeaks, things like PayPal and, M and Amazon, and their overreaction to the, uh, to the high blow and hyster hysteric rhetoric that came out of government to, uh, 
to basically cut WikiLeaks, to cut WikiLeaks off and to pretend that's not part of WikiLeaks. That requires also a very important pushback against those organisations. This is not the first time we've been there with these organisations. Those of you who follow Chinese politics would know that there was a period about 10 years ago when organisations like Yahoo, for example, were leaning over themselves to cooperate with the, with the Chinese government. We pushed back successfully, the, the global free speech community pushed back successfully against that, humiliated and embarrassed those organisations, and I think we need to do something very similar with those organisations that are seeking to hang out WikiLeaks to dry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christopher. If you have questions, you should hold up your note card and they will be collected so that we can um, deal with those questions after the speakers. Emily Bell is next, director of the Tao Center for Digital Journalism at Columbia University, which provides journalists with the skills and knowledge to lead the future of digital journalism and serves as a research and development hub for the profession. Prior to her job at Columbia, uh, Emily Bell was director of digital con uh, content for Britain's Guardian News and Media from 2006 to 2010. Emily Bell. Um, thank you, Amy, um, and uh, thanks everyone for coming out and being so engaged in this uh, subject. As Amy said, um, my interest in this is twofold. Partly it's my old job. I was um, a career journalist for 20 odd years, uh, 10 years in print, 10 years online. The first five or six of those was being editor in chief of the Guardian's websites the last three or four overseeing everything they did digitally. Um, and one of the things we thought three or four years ago was that um, the way that data was released was going to really be sort of, it was going to be a core job of journalistic organizations to uh, understand how to uh, parse and handle um, that kind of data securely. So it was of some uh, pride and relief to me that when <clears throat> the WikiLeaks cables landed, that one of the reasons I think the Guardian was able to do that was because, it's a, and it's not me, I'd like to take all credit for this, but obviously it's not me because I don't have a CS background, um, but the, the forward thinking nature of where is journalism going and what is going to be important in order to hold power to account was something that actually had allowed the Guardian to develop the right capabilities. Um, and my second sort of interest in this is as a, a very new journalism professor. I'm new, new to America, I'm new to academia. Um, and I'm obviously kind of uh, in month two of my stint to have something like WikiLeaks fall on your head is, is, is a uh, gift because it's course material for the next 10, 15 years. Um, and in fact, Columbia this uh, fall, we have um, got a WikiLeaks seminar that we'll be teaching our students uh, because we think that it's a prism um, through which you can view many, many ways in which journalism's actually been changing for quite a long time. It's just that you always need events uh, to focus our attention on how uh, the structure of information uh, and the tensions in journalism um, have actually changed, and, and my goodness, what an event to do that. So I'll keep it brief because I'm a woman, so I will be able to stick to time um, and just say what the... So I just... Cheap shot. Um, and, on a... and actually, kind of from my point of view, which is how do we equip, how do we equip the next generation of journalists is actually a, 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 an important one, because I do completely buy into uh, what all the previous speakers have said, which is that um, it is a distributed and networked world in which the, the role of the professional journalist has um, radically changed and to a large extent been uh, either replicated or completely replaced by the activities both of algorithms and people uh, and technology. Um, I don't think, however, that this negates the need for professional journalism. Um, I do think it means that uh, Professional journalists have to really think very hard about the core purpose of what they do. Uh, and the core purpose of what they do is, at the end of the day, to hold power to account and add clarity to democracy. Uh, and I think that one of the things that WikiLeaks did was catch a number of organizations uh, you know, with their, their, their trousers or pants, as you guys would say, at half-mast in, in that area, which is, it was very interesting to me to ask large groups of students uh, the instant reaction to what would you do if this came, this fell onto your desk, 
uh, and it's interesting to see how young people struggle immediately with the, well, hang on a second, um, if, I'm, if I'm a professional journalist at a big newspaper, might I give it back? You know, it's stolen. This is what the Pentagon said. And I, I, I think that what this episode has done is, is teach uh, our next generation of journalists that um, actually know what you do is you go ahead and you publish um, and you publish responsibly. But in terms of how, how we need to think about it and think about the skills that we give people uh, and what we know has changed, we need to be much more technologically literate as a profession because actually uh, in terms of the free press of the 21st century, we don't own the free press um, and there isn't one. And, and as much as there is one, it's owned by Facebook and Google and Twitter and platforms and it's uh, debated and carved up uh, by a number of interests in terms of FCC regulation uh, and Washington and even in most major news organizations there's a very poor understanding of exactly what the technological issues are and how they can be addressed and how that can be networked into a proper reporting uh, structure. Um, even the legal issues uh, uh, are becoming manifold and, and, and very complex and difficult for any single organization to understand because, um, uh, as, as, as Mika said earlier, it's a pan-national issue, actually, so I think that's great. But it, it means that we have to, I think, shift how professional journalism is done to understanding how to tap those networks of activity, how to, if you like, enable uh, the connection of expertise and clarification and how to ensure that you're able to maintain a pre free press on a platform that you not, not only don't own, but that you don't necessarily, as organizations or, vi or individuals, understand. And that means there has to be a very, very steep collective learning curve, I think, for anyone who wants to consider themselves a member of the professional press. Um, and I'll just sort of stop here, because it would be much more interesting to hear what you guys have to say about it. Uh, I think also we had... Um, a very, very sort of interesting uh, couple of talks up at Columbia, uh, one of which with, uh, was with the editor of the New York Times um, and uh, the editor of uh, The Guardian. And the thing that suddenly struck me halfway through this was you had these two significantly resourced news organizations and that actually the thing that was really striking was not only were they not really technologically prepared and they were probably technologically better prepared than almost any other news organization in the world would have been. They also weren't really journalistically prepared. The amount of information that needs um, looking at, reporting, which is important information, was overwhelming. Uh, and uh, the, the very fact that at the end of December, um, if you like, the, sort of the curtain came down for those organizations, it was almost with kind of like physical exhaustion saying it's now somebody else's time to have a look at it. Uh, and there is so much more to be reported. And I think there's a very interesting thing here which should happen in terms of the public sphere. I think universities have a role in this. I think experts everywhere have a role in this, in archiving, examining, reporting on, and even being able to demonstrate how these stories have had an impact and what, what the impacts have been. Um, because I think that that's something which you can actually report on that story for years and years to come, which, as I say, is a very good thing for those of us who are professionally employed to do such a thing. Um, but I think it's, it's, we haven't really begun to actually see how those changes play out in the profession yet, because I still think the profession is in a state of shock, uh, I think, but I think that it's highlighted some incredibly important issues, which if we don't address from the point of view of needing a free press, uh, are, are things where we will lose an awful lot of kind of ability and freedom quite quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Next, we'll hear from Glenn Greenwald, who just won the Online Journalism Award for his coverage of the treatment and the conditions under which Bradley Manding is held. He is... Glenn is a contributing writer at Salon. Uh, his political reporting analysis appear in the New York Times, Washington Post, The American Conservative, numerous congressional reports. He's a New York Times best-selling author. His three books are A Tragic Legacy, How a Good versus Evil Mentality Destroyed the Bush Presidency. Um, also, uh, he wrote How Would a Patriot Act? And 
his latest book, Great American Hypocrites, Toppling the Big Myths of Republican Politics. Glenn Greenwald. Thank you to everybody for coming out today. I've been really enthused by how much interest there is in the WikiLeaks controversy. And the reason for that is because not only is there so much at stake in this conflict, and there is, but also it is one of the most revealing political controversies that has arisen in quite a long time. And in particular, I think it's extremely revealing about how establishment media outlets and their employees think about their function and think about their role. One of the things that was most striking to me early on about the coverage of WikiLeaks in the American media, and especially in the wake of the release of the diplomatic cables, was that media figures were not only participating in the hostility towards the condemnation of WikiLeaks, they were actually taking a leading role in condemning WikiLeaks and insisting that something should be done. One of the first and, and most illustrative incidents that I recall was I was watching CNN, um, which is something I try hard not to do too much, but I was doing it on this day. I think I was traveling and have that as my excuse. And um, Wolf Blitzer was on and he was talking about the release of the diplomatic cables that had just happened and he was absolutely furious. He wasn't furious, of course, about the illegality and deceit and corruption that these cables revealed, that the State Department had ordered spying on UN officials in violation of treaties, or that the US had secretly participated in bombing, bombing campaigns in Yemen, contrary to the statements of the State Department, or any of these other things. What he was furious about was that the US government hadn't taken more steps to protect and safeguard this information. What he was basically saying was, I am absolutely outraged that I've learned about these things that the government did. I'm furious that you didn't do a better job of concealing it from me. Which is really quite a remarkable thing for a journalist to admit being angry about. And I actually wrote about it at the time, but as it turned out, that was not a particularly unusual incident. Um, it was to be quite representative of how American media figures thought about WikiLeaks generally. I did lots of shows in the aftermath of the diplomatic cables, and typically the format would be I was on as the designated WikiLeaks defender. And I would typically be on the show with some member of the political class who, of course, was furious that WikiLeaks had breached this confidentiality. Um, and then there would be a media figure who would generally host the discussion or participate in it as well. And what, in every single case I found, was that it was always two against one. The person who was the designated representative of the political class and the person there posing as the journalist, the actor who plays the role of journalist on television, <laughs> were saying exactly the same things about WikiLeaks that was completely indistinguishable, their mindset. I mean, it made sense to me that members of the political class were angry about what WikiLeaks was doing. They want to protect their prerogatives and their power of maintaining secrecy. But the idea that journalists thought exactly the same way and were even angrier about it was, I admit, and perhaps it was a little bit naive, somewhat surprising to me. And the reason it was surprising to me is because what WikiLeaks is doing and what their mission is, is really what the core of journalism is supposed to be about, which is providing accountability on the world's most powerful factions by exposing the deceitful and wrongful things they do in secret. And, you know, I think we're all well aware of the fact that that isn't really what establishment journalists do. So I wasn't surprised about that, but what surprised me is that they do think it's important to maintain the pretense that that's what they do. And yet here, in the, within a case of WikiLeaks, they weren't even slightly interested in pretending that exposing the secrets of the politically and corporate powerful is something that they value. In fact, they were quite explicit about the fact um, that they were angry about it. And the other reason why it surprised me, their reaction, and Chris touched on this a little bit um, as well, is that in the wake of the WikiLeaks releases, there were, it, was, it wasn't just a lot of people calling for their prosecution, it was really a consensus in the political class that what WikiLeaks had done was a serious crime and that they ought to be prosecuted. That was pretty much the consensus of Republicans and Democrats alike. And yet, if you were to actually prosecute WikiLeaks for releasing classified information, it would be the very first time in American history that a non-government employee would be prosecuted for releasing classified information. There would be no greater threat imaginable to press freedom in the United States than prosecution 
of WikiLeaks. And you would think that people who call themselves journalists, who like to think of themselves as being involved in the business of releasing government secrets, would consider that to be a very severe threat, something that they ought to speak out against, and yet they weren't. They were actually joining in the chorus and calling for the prosecution of WikiLeaks, reading really um, leading the chorus, and, and that too surprised me. It surprised me because you can pick up the New York Times every day and read government secrets being exposed. Bob Woodward, who is universally adored by everyone in mainstream media outlets, has gotten extremely rich by writing books every year that expose government secrets. Now, these are secrets that government officials want exposed. They're often secrets that reflect well on the government, but it's still the release of classified information in violation of the law, and if you empower the government to prosecute people who do that, you will absolutely give the government immense power over even establishment journalists, and you think that even they would be wary of that, and yet they weren't. And so part of what I tried to do is to understand what it was about them and how they function and reason that led them to this hostility, notwithstanding those things I just described. And I think part of it is obviously just some basic competitiveness, that um, everybody competes over who gets scoops. In a single year, WikiLeaks was responsible for more scoops, more huge stories than every media outlet in the United States combined. And so there was certainly some competitive jealousy. I think Greg is right that they like to think of themselves as the anointed gatekeepers over the information that the citizenry will learn about, and WikiLeaks had usurped that power, and there was anger over that. But I think the real source of the hostility is the difference between being deferential to political power and being adversarial to it. WikiLeaks, unlike the established media, doesn't maintain the pretense of being adversarial to political power. They are actually adversarial to political power. And the difference is not, it's not just that that's not how the American media reacts, it's that American journalists, establishment journalists, identify as part of the political structure, as part of the political culture in Washington. So anything that is adversarial to political power they find and view as an attack on them as well because they are a part of that culture. And I think that there's been very few people who have been more helpful in bringing that to light than Bill Keller, the executive editor of the New York Times, who has done his paper a great disservice by doing something executive editors don't usually do, which is he's now speaking out publicly in a variety of forums and therefore revealing how he actually thinks. It was a lot better for the newspaper when he just remained this sort of mysterious figure. But one of the things that, that he's been doing is he's been running around on this crusade in which he's obsessed with proving to the world that what he does and what WikiLeaks does are radically different. And so one of the ways that he's been doing this, there's a BBC interview where he did this most explicitly, is he's extremely proud of the fact that before publishing any information, the New York Times runs to the Obama administration and clears it first with them. And he actually talked about this in a BBC interview, and the BBC host, and there was also in this debate, um, a former British ambassador to the UN were, were shocked, not that they were doing this, but that he was admitting it and being so proud of it. And they actually said, are you actually saying that the New York Times, before it publishes information, clears it with the United States government? Like, you're admitting that? And the UN ambassador said, this proves that if you want to actually learn what's going on in the world, you should go directly to the WikiLeaks site and read the cables there and not read the parts that the New York Times has published. And, you know, what really struck me about it is you have to look at these interviews and, and, and see just how proud he is of the fact that the Obama administration has been complimentary of how responsible the New York Times has been in these disclosures. And the contrast to me was so great, a, the, the great journalist David Halberstam gave a speech at Columbia University to journalism students a year or so before he died. And he said, in talking to these journalism students, that his proudest moment in his career was when he was a young reporter in Vietnam, and he stood up at a press conference and challenged the claims of generals who had been making claims about what had happened in the battlefield that he knew to be false. And he had this enormous conflict, and they tried to intimidate him, and they went to the new, the, his editors and demanded that he be taken off the story. And his proudest moment was when he stood up to political authority and made them angry and provoked their outrage and objections. Bill Bill Keller's proudest moment is being patted on the head by the Obama administration for good behavior. And that really, I think, signals the American media and what it is. Um, 
just one, one last point about this is it, what, what's so interesting is that even in those rare instances where the U.S. media does actually reveal important secrets about the U.S. government against its will, there's still a great deal of deference exhibited by media institutions. So when the New York Times revealed the Bush administration's warrantless eavesdropping program, it was subsequently revealed that they had actually learned about it a year earlier than they published it and yet waited until George Bush was safely reelected before telling the American people about it because the Bush administration asked them to do so. And when the, when the Washington Post, when Dana Priest reported, to her credit, it was a great story, that the CIA had maintained a network of secret CIA sites where people were disappeared to, the CIA requested that when she published that, that she not reveal the names of the specific Eastern European countries in which these prisons were being, lo were being uh, lo were located because if they, she revealed them, it would jeopardize their ability to continue to operate them. And she complied with that request um, and withheld the names of those countries to allow these programs to continue. And there was a recent controversy because there was a uh, individual, Raymond Davis, who was detained by Pakistani authorities because he had shot two Pakistani citizens. Um, and the Pakistani press was claiming that he was a CIA agent. And yet Barack Obama came out and said, we demand the release of our diplomat. And the New York Times knew that Raymond Davis was in fact working for the CIA, and yet they concealed that information while reporting Barack Obama's false claims that this was our diplomat in Pakistan. And what this reveals is, and I had a debate about this with Jack Goldsmith, a former Bush official in the Justice Department, who said that this is a good thing that the um, American media is so deferential to government requests because what it shows is that we have a patriotic media. That's what he called it. And as I understand it, at least, patriotism, especially for journalists, is not about demonstrating fealty and allegiance to government officials. It's about holding those government officials accountable. And that's what WikiLeaks actually does and why they're so threatening. The journalism professor at NYU, Jay Rosen, has, says, has said that they're the first stateless media organization, meaning they have no allegiance to any specific country's government, their allegiance is to the truth, and that's what has provoked such great hostility among government and media officials alike. I just want to say one point about, uh, to, to close this up, about the importance of WikiLeaks and why I think it's worth um, so much focus and attention. The regime of secrecy that is maintained is unquestionably the principal instrument that allows pervasive abuse and lawbreaking. If you look at what has happened in the Bush administration and now in the Obama administration, secrecy is the linchpin of everything that's done. That's why there's been such an attempt to preserve the state secrets doctrine, which when Bush invoked it was, such, was so controversial, and yet now Obama administration has embraced it completely to shield executive action from any form of scrutiny, including judicial review. And one of the things that's so interesting about the diplomatic cables that were released, because it shows that what our government does is they reflexively hide behind a wall of secrecy virtually every single thing that they do of any consequence. And WikiLeaks is really one of the very few true threats to the government and corporate consortium that run the government in the national security state and the surveillance state. And that's what makes WikiLeaks so vital, is that what really is at stake is a war over internet freedom, the ability of the American citizenry to remain informed about what their government is doing. And the government realizes that there's no way to stop the technology that enables what WikiLeaks is doing. You could destroy WikiLeaks tomorrow, you could keep Julian Assange in prison for the rest of his life, and overnight there will be all sorts of other um, models that replicate what WikiLeaks has done. There'll be un unquestionably innovations. You cannot stop technologically what WikiLeaks has begun. There's no way for the US government to prevent that. But, so what they're interested in doing and what they're obsessed with doing is to create a climate of fear for any would-be whistleblowers in the future or people who want to be the new WikiLeaks. And that's what the unprecedented war on whistleblowers is about, being conducted by the Obama administration. That's the reason why Bradley Manning is being held in solitary confinement and stripped naked and degraded and subjected to inhumane conditions. It's the same reason why the Bush administration tortured people and disappeared people and put them in orange jumpsuits and shackles and showed the world what they were doing. It's a way for the US government to say 
that our power is unconstrained and unlimited. And if you challenge us or undermine our authority in any way, what we will do to you is without limits and there's nothing anybody can do about it. And what it's really saying is that to all future would-be people who discover government deceit and illegality and who think about exposing, who want to expose it, it's saying to them, before you do that, you should look at what's being done to Bradley Manning and to these people whom we're prosecuting who did the same thing. That's what we can do to you. That's the government strategy for preventing one of the very few avenues that we still have left for learning what the government does, which is whistleblowing and unauthorized disclosures. And if the government succeeds in that, then that one avenue will be extinguished. But if people who are committed to defending transparency and open government defend WikiLeaks and stand up against those efforts, then that transparency can be preserved and it can, can continue. And that's what I think is at stake. That's why I write so much about WikiLeaks and why I'm so glad that so many people are here to talk about it as well. Thank you very much. Okay, we only have about 14 minutes. There are a lot of questions. Um, so I'm just gonna uh, ask you to answer briefly. Um, I think this one um, will go to Greg Mitchell. Why hasn't WikiLeaks made all the documents public for everyone to read the source material unredacted? That's a question from Paul Wright, editor of Prison Legal News. Well, I, I, I wish I knew that. I, I, I do know that there are uh, behind the scenes right now sort of uh, unprecedented uh, steps they're trying to take that would release uh, all those documents to a wide variety of journalists. Um, they are, um, I, I don't know why they haven't been able to publish them all. I think it's a matter of, um, you know, uh, of logistics or resources. Uh, what they have done in, in a savvy way, as someone previously mentioned, was that they have, uh, as various uh, places around the globe, uh, Tunisia and Egypt and uh, Bahrain, uh, Yemen, Libya, and many other countries that uh, maybe we don't uh, know that much about, they go in and cherry pick <laughs> cables that are tied to what's going on in that country. And they've done it uh, so that when events have come up in, uh, for example, in Egypt, they had uh, numerous cables that were very relevant to abuses, torture, police uh, uh, actions, M Mubarak's corruption, uh, Suleiman's involvement in torture, and so forth. So I think on the one hand, we, we may lament that they haven't been able to get all the documents out there, but on the other hand, they have released uh, some in a very timely way that have helped fuel these, uh, reveal, uh, all these revolts in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, this one will start with Mika and whoever wants to respond to him. Why did you say Julian Assange is autocratic and why and how is it pertinent to the overall good that his organization has done? Well, um, this is based on the uh, um, uh, statements of some of his former associates, uh, all of whom wanted uh, the organization to be run in a more democratic manner than he runs it. Um, and, uh, you know, Daniel Domscheit-Berg, who was his uh, close partner for several years in, in uh, running WikiLeaks and who broke uh, with him back in the fall, both over uh, the inability to have a discussion over how WikiLeaks was handling the war logs and whether or not they should um, redact any information in those logs. The, the, the organization, that decision was made by Julian alone. Secondly, when the charges uh, were raised about his, his personal life in Sweden, uh, all of these associates uh, were saying, you know, you really ought to step aside and let other people run WikiLeaks um, while you take care of the problems in your personal life. It's gonna hurt the larger cause of the organization. And he told people to piss off and I could read you the, the full quote, if you like. Uh, it's in my book. It was in uh, Wired published, the transcript of the chat log between him and, and Daniel Domscheit Berg. I think it hurts the larger cause that WikiLeaks represents for it to be so autocratically controlled. Um, and I think that's why I say a year from now, we probably won't be talking so much about WikiLeaks as the larger movement for citizen-driven transparency. I think OpenLeaks, which is still in gestation, 
uh, but which we'll be launching with a few uh, initial partners, hopefully by this summer, it may give us uh, another model that is not so centralized. I mean, the reason why we're not getting more leaks out of WikiLeaks now, what, where's the Bank of America stuff? Where's the stuff that that guy in Switzerland, uh, who has now been arrested, handed him with all these people who are using Switzerland as a tax haven? Um, why hasn't that been released? And the, the answer is, Julian won't answer. <laughs> um, I mean, to me, you know, I, it's true uh, uh, what my colleague to the left said about, you know, uh, journalists uh, don't have to have likable personalities to do important work. I agree with that. Uh, but still, it's important to hold him accountable, too, and uh, he's refused. So I think we have to question that authority as well. And uh, in the long run, it will be better if we have a more distributed network for whistleblowers getting their information out and not, it not all being stopped up on, on uh, Julian's laptop. Glenn Greenwald. Take the mic. So I agree absolutely with the principle that, the, that all organizations, including WikiLeaks, ought to be subjected to accountability. But I think one of the principal ways that people who stand up to political power are discredited and undermined is by having a tax raised on their personality. You can ask Daniel Ellsberg about that. Um, and you know, if you listen to many of the media attacks on WikiLeaks, they focus on these tabloidy, personality-driven um, attributes of Julian Assange. You know, Bill Keller courageously reported that he actually wears dirty socks. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of, um, you know, the, a lot of the focus that has been directed at Julian that Assange. That Bill Keller is, wears dirty socks? What's that? Bill Keller wears dirty socks? No, that Julian Assange oh, wears dirty I'm socks. I'm glad you clarified. Bill Keller socks are pristine. Um, and, you know, one of, one of the things that I, I think is, you know, so important is that the scrutiny that Julian Assange has received is scrutiny that virtually nobody in power ever gets. Do you think the New York Times would ever write about the personality quirks of you leading U.S. senators or members of the House or the cabinet or anything else? So I, I do think that there are issues internally like there are with most organizations. Mika earlier called Julian a flawed individual. I'm not aware of any individuals who are unflawed. Um, but I think that in the context of what has happened overall, Julian Assange has fearlessly stood up to the world's most powerful factions in ways that most individuals can only dream about achieving. And whatever criticisms there are of his personality or management style pale completely in comparison to the good that he's done. And while I agree that accountability is needed for everyone, including him, I think we have to be careful not to focus on those kind of personality issues as a means of under, uh, undermining um, and diluting the, the true good that WikiLeaks has done. As an attorney for 20 years and a journalist and artist, how can we, we lawyers support you in the press best? Blogs, websites, what? Loan your fees. <laughs> Loan your fees. Very good answer. Sorry. That was very a, good answer. But, sorry, that was a very flippant answer, but it's actually true. One of the things that the legal in, uh, profession could do is lower its fees. Um, lower we fees. had a very interesting um, experience at The Guardian at the beginning of last year with uh, a company called Trafigura, um, which had been illegally dumping uh, toxic waste off the African coast. Uh, and it was subject, our reporting of it was subjected to a super injunction, which meant that we couldn't even report the fact that a question had been asked about it in Parliament, which is one of those legal strictures that is, is, is threatening uh, free speech. Um, we actually kind of ended it somehow. Uh, the question, the parliamentary question, ended up uh, on a uh, website, uh, not ours, uh, and it was pointed to by social media, um, including Twitter. And the, 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 the the hashtag traffic era spread, uh, started to trend, more people started to look at it because nobody knew what it was, um, and the entire case collapsed. But we did a kind of quick mental calculation on, on what that would have cost us to defend legally, and the answer was hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, the more serious answer to that is, in terms of how can um, the legal uh, profession support, is I just think that it's enormously valuable for individual and collectives or, collectives or, 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 or corporations who are interested in doing good work to have the best legal advice on a number of uh, fronts. And this is something which um, the professional journalism and unprofessional, not unprofessional, uh, amateur journalists 
need to be constantly informed. So publish clear, uh, good information, guidelines on these things that would otherwise be very, very expensive to understand where you're actually fighting quite often very well-resourced corporations as well as governments in terms of, of, of legality because it's very important that people understand it. Uh, and it's actually something where the cost of it is prohibitive now for most um, non-mainstream news organisations. Next question. And clearly the discourse over the next two years will be dominated by corporate sponsored voices who are running for President of the United States. What can we do to establish a widely heard counter-narrative? Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting. I think every single event that I ever do that talks about any sort of deficiencies in political or media institutions ultimately entails that question. And I'm glad it does, and it should. At the same time, I sometimes feel like the premise of the question is that things like what we're doing here today don't actually qualify as, quote, doing something. Um, and I think, you know, if you look at even the events in the Middle East and the extraordinary way in which the most entrenched dictators have been overthrown pretty rapidly by some pretty disempowered citizenry that have been kept poor and uneducated, you see the power of citizens talking to one another about their discontent and persuading one another that the level of corruption is so great and the need for action is so great that massive collective action becomes possible. And there's all kinds of technologies now that allow people to build large audiences and to reach large numbers of their fellow citizens without having to rely upon corporate media entities. And I think that has succeeded greatly. I mean, just even the Bradley Manning situation exemplifies how that works. Um, that's a controversy that took down the spokesman of the State Department who courageously spoke out against it, something quite out of character for him, but still commendable, that the president had to address and ultimately defend and created a serious controversy that all began on internet venues that are completely independent of and even hostile to corporate media outlets. Every single day, people who work in independent media like Amy Goodman, like a lot of us, have the ability heightened to be able to influence public discourse, to have ideas that used to be excluded injected into the public dialogue. And I think um, I'm at least pretty optimistic about that trend continuing. Okay, if, uh, just what, very, very quickly, Ed, I don't know if, this, if we can break the dominant narrative, but just adding to what Glenn said, if you live in Iowa or New Hampshire, or you know people who do, or you want to spend some time up there, that is the only moment where we actually can access these candidates when they're most vulnerable. So show up at these meetings with your camera, video, put it up on the web, ask them hard questions. Um, we've got a, a, a window there. Uh, before they get completely, you know, uh, put behind the, uh, the velvet rope. Um, so let's take advantage of it. Um, today is Dan Ellsberg's 80th birthday, as uh, I think you noted, Greg. Um, um, he is devoting everything now to helping Bradley Manning. And I don't know if we've gotten a clear description of what is happening with Bradley Manning right now. Um, uh, if you could just tell us what is the situation, Greg, uh, Glenn. Well, it's in a way gone into a bit of a blackout the last couple of weeks uh, after, the, after all the protests. And it was very revealing that it took uh, P.J. Crawley, the State Department, flack to uh, protest that finally, finally after, uh, I guess, nine months, um, the editorial pages of the New York Times and the Los Angeles Times and some other papers for the first time raised a protest against his conditions. You know, Glenn was so influential in, in helping to expose this last December, and even after the blackout before December ended, we had three or four months where not a peep was said by any of these media outlets about it. So, but it took the State Department flack uh, losing his job for that, for that to happen. Since then, uh, and the controversy, it, there really hasn't been much known. I, I suspect perhaps maybe his conditions have been eased. Uh, we heard from his attorney for the first time yes, just yesterday uh, after he was quiet for some time, and he revealed, I guess rather shockingly, or not so, that uh, Dennis Kucinich, the UN uh, person who is, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, um, Kucinich, the UN representative who is investigating Manning's, uh, the conditions, and an Amnesty International official have all been denied the chance to visit Manning. 
Uh, so that was the latest update, um, you know, that we've had uh, as of yesterday. So obviously things are not are, are not all well there in, in, in any case. Glenn, anything else you want to add? Okay. Where does the underground organization Anonymous fit into the movement to push back? Should this type of citizen hacktivism be supported and emulated? Isn't the only power we have, isn't this the only power we have against corporations? I, you know, I cover Anonymous a little bit in my book, um, and it's fascinating. First of all, uh, for people who don't know, it's hard to describe, because, and that's part of the idea, I think, um, is because it's amorphous, it's, it's distributed, uh, it, again, like WikiLeaks, is uh, stateless, um, and sometimes it's incredibly mature and misogynist and racist. Um, it, not everything that has been claimed by Anonymous as its activities is, is progressive. Um, in the case of the WikiLeaks pushback, uh, they did a number of things that were really quite good, like um, rallying people to dig into the cables to try and highlight, you know, the news that was not being exposed. Um, the more controversial tactic is this distributed denial of service uh, attacks where they've made it possible for people, it's risky, by the way, if you do this, um, to, you know, download a, a bit of software, put it on your computer, and then uh, when anonymous somehow decides to go after a target, your computer will help uh, try and take down a website. And they did this to PayPal, and they did this to uh, uh, MasterCard Visa, uh, a bank in Switzerland. They did it to the lawyer who was uh, uh, handling the case in Sweden of the two women who were uh, making charges against Assange. Um, and, you know, there's a debate in my community over whether or not this is legitimate civil disobedience or, or not. Um, I mean, in civil disobedience, I think you risk going to jail. You are not anonymous. You are making an act of moral, you know, you're taking a stand and you're willing to also, you know, admit that you're crossing the line. Here it is anonymous. That's one issue that we have to wrestle with. The other one, and this is just my personal view, is that embracing this specific tactic of the distributed denial of service is very dangerous. It's like saying we should uh, legalize poison gas. Um, it's gonna blow back mostly onto the weaker websites, human rights organizations, dissident groups, who cannot afford to defend themselves from these kinds of attacks. Big corporations, you know, it's a little bit like a, a lot of mosquitoes biting them for a day. It may feel good, it may be good for visibility, but it's, it, it, it hardly seems like the, the, uh, the smartest thing to promote. I just have a little bit of a different view. I mean, it's true, Anonymous is a, a very amorphous collective, so it's extremely difficult to talk about them monolithically, and there's lots of stuff they've done that's worthy of criticism. So I'm gonna ignore those parts and address only the issue about what they've done in the WikiLeaks situation. Um, the, you know, if we had a perfect world, I would say that we ought to discourage the kinds of illegal denial of service attacks that they were launching because it can lead to all sorts of anarchy and Mika's right that then weaker sites are more vulnerable, but that's not the world we have. The world in which we live is one in which the world's most powerful factions are using cyber attacks very aggressively. And from, in my view, what has been so revealing about the Anonymous case is that shortly before Anonymous launched these attacks, WikiLeaks, was targeted by a vastly more powerful and sophisticated cyber attack that actually knocked them offline in the United States and prevented any U.S. hosting companies from continuing to keep them online. And for some very strange reason, the Justice Department has been very interested in finding who's responsible for the anonymous tax, uh, tax but hasn't evinced any interest at all in finding out who was responsible for those attacks on WikiLeaks. Um, and that shows you, even though those attacks are every bit as illegal and were far more threatening and sophisticated, and that shows you that there's already this war um, that's being waged over internet freedom, and the only question is whether the war will be fought in a one-sided way or a two-sided way. Um, and although I wish that denial of service attacks and cyber attacks weren't part of the internet and weren't threatening internet freedom, the reality is that they are, and I think engaging that fight um, and preventing it from being a one-sided attack on balance is, is probably preferable than simply ceding the field to government and corporate authorities. As we wrap up, if each of you can talk about how they can access your information, each of you just explain the website or where you're tweeting everything. Sorry, how, how they can act like that? Yeah, find um, out. I'm Emily, uh, at Emily Belt on Twitter, uh, which, which is where I 
post also my profile links to the, uh, my personal website, the Columbia website, and I put my phone number on there as well, because, you know, hey, <laughs> it's information. Right. Uh, our website is alliance.org.au, or a lot of this information, uh, a lot of the articles that have been written about this issue by Australian journalists from an Australian perspective are on our uh, professional website, which is walkleys.com. Uh, uh, W-A-L, that's the Australian A, as in A for America. Uh, <laughs> W-A-L-K-E-Y-S dot. So, um, personaldemocracy.com uh, is where you can find all the information about the conference, as well as our blogs. Uh, the conference is coming up June 6th and 7th in New York. And if you're interested, the, the early bird rate is, is expiring in, at the end of next week. Um, the uh, way to find me on Twitter is MLSIF, and I will just make a very um, self-promoting plea, which is if you are reading my book right now, or thinking about reading whatever, tweet at me that you're reading the book. I want to create a list of people who are reading it, and then I want to try and use the internet to figure out some way to gather people in a conversation and see if we can't channel some of that interest into supporting the movement for transparency. So MLSIF on Twitter. Uh, well, I'm still still doing the live blog at The Nation every single day, so it should be pretty easy to find that also. It's day 132. Yes, I've lost track. But, um, and, and I do other stories at The Nation as well, so pretty easy. Uh, Twitter is at Greg Mitch. And, um, there's, I'm having a book signing for my two WikiLeaks uh, and Bradley Manning books this afternoon at 3.45, so I invite you to stop by and chat, even if you don't buy the book, so thank you. Um, I write uh, pretty much on a daily basis at salon.com, where you can find my column, my blog, um, and I also have come to terms recently with the fact that I seem to have developed a Twitter addiction. Um, where, where, which manifests at Twitter, at G Greenwald. Um, I'm trying to curb that a little bit, but so far I've been unsuccessful, so you can find me there um, as well. G Greenwald, Twitter, G Greenwald. Uh, Salon.com. Um, and know that it's Odyssey Books that's here. Independent bookstores are endangered and they're very important. They're from Western Mass and um, everyone will be signing books there. Um, I'll also be signing books. And my Democracy Now! colleagues, Juan Gonzalez, who just won the Polk Award again yesterday, is gonna be speaking as well as Sharif. Um, Sharif abdel Kadus, he's speaking out in Seattle now. He did an incredible job covering the uh, uprising in Egypt, and he's going back to continue to do that, to tune into his reports at Democracy Now!, but he'll be here tomorrow, so uh, come out for his speech as well. Um, a few years ago, uh, Glenn Greenwald won the first Izzy Award, uh, and in uh, Mika Sifri's introduction to his book, uh, excuse me? I can't remember. Um, uh, uh, he once again quotes, uh, the great I.F. Stone, and we should remember this quote as we go out today. All governments lie, but disaster lies in wait for countries whose officials smoke the same hashish they give out. Thank you very much for joining us.